Today's episode of Baxi's Musical Podcast is brought to you by Canna Provisions. Canna Provisions is an adult-use cannabis dispensary with the largest selection of cannabis products in western Massachusetts with locations in both Holyoke and Lee. They offer a warm, unique shopping experience with guides rather than bud tenders. In fact, it's not just a dispensary, they're a destination. Visit CannaProvisions.com. That's CannaProvisions.com. Please be over 21 and please consume responsibly. And now... Baxi's musical podcast. What is it? What is it? It's Baxi's musical podcast. For every band that sells a million copies of an album, there's a million bands who don't. And if you've heard this podcast before, you know that we sometimes talk about an astounding amount of brilliant music out there that was played by people who either didn't make it, broke up too soon, ran into bad luck, had bad management, bad distribution, got a bad contract with a bad label, or simply had bad timing. Whatever it might be, those alleged near misses and missed opportunities are often beyond the artist's control. But from that, sometimes they leave behind a lot of great music that goes underdiscovered. In 1991, the Western Massachusetts band called The Size were signed by Charisma Records, a label that had once been home to Genesis and Peter Gabriel and the Alan Parsons Project and Julian Lennon and many others. They were a band that was assigned to work with producer Ed Stasium on their debut album, a guy who had worked with the Ramones, the Talking Heads, the Smithereens, Living Color, Motorhead, and loads more. Their first album, What Goes On, was released the following year in 1992. And despite great reviews with great power pop songs and being given the chance to be on the road, they never quite got the promotion or the notice that they probably deserved. Another album followed in 1996, the album Different. And despite another bunch of great songs, the size never quite got the commercial success that people expected them to have. But despite all that, the Sides are back, playing dates throughout the Northeast for their 30th anniversary of their first album. And bass player Tommy Pluta, who I've known for literally 20 years or so, has just released his first solo EP entitled Breathe, and it's fantastic. This is a guy who I've worked with. I've known members of his family. He's a sales executive. He distributes his own beer and a lot of other stuff, too. This is the first time, though, that we've had a chance to really dig down deep into his fascinating music career. This is my conversation with my friend Tommy Pluta from The Size on Baxi's Musical Podcast. It's funny, a, a few months ago, in, I go into my office, and there's a CD sitting right on my on my desk, and it's a copy of your, your EP, Breathe, and I'm thinking, you know, I, I, I knew you were in a band, or like other people had talked about you being in a band, but I never really... You went that deep to, t- to know about, you know, what they're talking about. So, yeah. Oh yeah, Tommy's been in a band. Well, like, yeah. And then I heard the CD, and I'm like, oh my god, this is fantastic. Oh, thanks. And this is Appreciate really, it. this yeah. is really very not, good. Not the guy just taking up space in the uh, by the water cooler, right? No, no, not <laughs> n- not at all. And and, uh, and and then you know, I learned yeah. a little bit more about about the size, and I and I and I go in and I start you know, like we were talking you know, earlier uh, this morning about mm-hmm. you know going down a rabbit hole, right? And and right. finding yourself getting into something that you know i like some of those songs were familiar to me and i'm like wait a minute i i do know these guys and yeah. it's 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 i didn't even realize that it was you and, and all i could think of is man you think you know a guy <laughs> <laughs> it's like, exactly Sorry. Uh, surprise yeah so tell me about yeah. the uh, the ep all right so uh yeah i mean well thanks thanks Bax, for having me on and um and everything and it's it's kind of fun to actually talk about these things because it's it is musical and it's fun to go back you know you talk about the size which uh you know our our debut cd it came out on charisma records what goes on I mean, 30 years this year yeah so you know you think about that 30 year span and you know coming out with breathe finally um was just something i think kind of i don't want to say it was pandemic driven but i did you know stay home more and i was in my home studio more and you know i said what's that dusty thing in the corner oh that's a guitar <laughs> maybe i should pick it up and tune it and you know all that kind of stuff so it's just it just started uh, happening, and when it happened, it happened fairly quickly. You know, the song started coming out, and um, you know, I just was like, okay, this is kind of fun. You know, to, to uh, and I started playing some demos uh, for Bobby LaRoche, 
uh, Robert LaRoche, as he goes by from the size, you know, he's my best friend. And uh, I went to visit him on the Cape, played him a couple of things. He's like, Tommy, you got to do an EP. And I'm like, okay. And, you know, it's easy to say, <laughs> but, you know, and then piecing it all together to the point where you have a final product that was sitting on your computer, you know, right. it takes, there's a, it takes a village, you know, there's a lot, a lot of work behind the scenes on it, but uh, I'm really happy that it came out the way it did and uh, th- that it's actually out, so. It's funny to me because you and I have probably known each other for about eighteen years, mm-hmm. and I've I've you know I've known members of your family. I know your brother uh, Tony <laughs> fairly well. I you know I knew your mom when she was the mayor of Holyoke. Sure. Your, your father in law has been my attorney for eighteen years. I mean, it just I yeah. I've I've known so much about you, but not necessarily about this aspect. Yeah. Of you, and so to hear this, because I mean, a lot of people, you know, occasionally get CDs, and and they they wind up becoming nothing more than, you know, glorified coasters around the house. <laughs> but I'm listening to this in my yeah. car, and I'm going, it's a great effort and a great bunch of power pop songs. You know, when you and I have talked about music, yeah, you know, there's clearly a common thread between what what you are inspired by and what I'm inspired by, mm-hmm. and we've had those conversations, but we haven't really had you know, real deep, meaningful conversations about, right. you know, what really has inspired songs like this. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think what kicked everything off for me, Bax, was, you know, I guess, you know, maybe it was, like I said, pandemic-driven or whatever the case may be, but um, when George, George Floyd's murder happened, uh, you know, I had this riff. It was kind of a beatle thing, and I had some some chords, and, um you know, I just, it wasn't so much about right or wrong or what, it's just like the world seemed like it was going mad. It was probably, yeah. I don't know, four or five, maybe the sixth time this has happened in recent months. And I just started kind of reflecting on, you know, how upside down this all sounded and, you know, there's two sides of it and it, there's just, it's, it, in you know, not taking any side really. It was just sort of how I, you know, interpret it and my... My cousin uh, is married into a mixed family, and I have, uh, you know, my cousins or my, I call them my nephews, they're mixed. And, you know, I'm just like, I don't know what it's like to feel the things that they feel, you know. Right. Uh, you know, I had my, my cousin's husband, uh, you know, we went out one night and saw a bunch of friends and we were out. And just even reflecting back on, did he feel weird meeting my friends? Like, did it, was it, did anyone give him a hard time? Like, was it like, I just, you know, something we don't think about, you know, and, and they, do have that happen, you know, and I was like, man, I really don't know what it's like, you know, that kind of kicked off the song. So when I wrote the lyrics, they happened very quickly. Uh, I wrote the song after the initial riff. It was one of those ones you hear like, oh, it took five minutes, you know, and literally probably within 10, as fast as I could write, it I, was had, I had the lyrics, which usually take me the longest. Um, so, so I was really inspired at that point. I thought I had a pretty good song. I'm like, hey, this would be great for Lenny Kravitz, you know, if he ever decided to cover a song or someone like that, you know, like, you know that ha- that has that Beatley kind of influence to them. You know this this would be a kind of a cool tune to uh, have them cover or get it covered by somebody. John Waite, who knows? You know, right? Whatever. But um, and then uh, it was one of the ones I played for for uh, for Bobby, and um, he was like, "Man, this is really powerful lyric here." And and so um, I decided to record it. My that was the first song, and I did it locally in Long Meadow at Spirit House Studios. My good friends Danny Bernini and Paul McNamara, who owned the studio. And uh, I played them the demo, and they, they're also like, we got to get in and track this, you know. So uh, I did. It was the, the first song, and it kind of kicked off, okay, I better finish it now because I'm committed to doing an EP here. So, <laughs> and so, so just so everyone's uh, aware of which song you're talking about. We're yeah, talking it's about called Breathe. Breathe. Yeah, the song Breathe. It's, it, it's um, j- you know, just basically I just want to breathe again. You know, it's, it's faith in humanity. It's faith in each other, finding yeah. peace, and just, you know, becoming one, you know, one, like, Everything was so crazy. It's like, how do we just get back to what what was once sort of normal, you know? And and maybe maybe at some point it's maybe it's a good thing that we need to uncover some things and talk about some new things, you know, and and figure out some stuff, you know. And and, and that's also provokes that too, yeah. you know. I can agree with that. You know that you know we all kind of look at at, at race as being not our problem, but right. really when you look at it. I mean, it's everyone's problem right. because I want to be as good to people as I can possibly be. Yeah. And what am I doing or not doing that may be an impediment to somebody else, you know, enjoying, you know, their own life exactly. and without yeah. fear or trepidation. I mean, it's healthy when people are acknowledging it, whether it's, 
just in, in conversation or artistically. It's good to have that out there. Yeah. So people kind of learn, you know, from that example. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And that's kind of what the idea of behind that song, Breathe, was. It was just sort of like, let's take, maybe we take a step back or we take a step forward, right. you know, however it plays out. But we need to you know, take a deep breath and, and kind of figure this out and, and just, you know, like you said, just be decent to each other. And I think if that's how you are, that's how you'll be. One of the things that that is that is true, and and not to get off <laughs> race here for a second, but yeah. one of the things that I you know, was really thinking about when I when I talked about having you, uh, you know, on the podcast is that you know, Western Massachusetts gets this inferiority complex as far as music that has been born out of this area. Mm-hmm. You hear about you know a scene in Boston, or you see you know or maybe you know Connecticut or New Haven or New York or whatever yeah. it may be. But when you go down the list of bands that have emerged out of Western Massachusetts, it's a profoundly important list. And I'm and I'm not just talking about Stain, but I'm talking about you know Dinosaur Junior and Sonic Youth lived up in Northampton uh, for a period of time. The Pixies were out of here. Elliot Smith mm-hmm. went to uh, to Hampshire College. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of music that came out of here. Yeah. In the early '90s, when the size first got together. What was that scene like? Because that actually precedes me coming out here by yeah. by uh, you know, three or four years. Yeah, it was great. I mean, you know, and even another uh, name to add to your list there is Chris Collingwood from Fountains of Wayne. Right, uh, lives lives right. locally. Um, you know, it was really uh, dynamic back then. There were a lot of great bands. I think we all pushed each other. We used to play a lot with a band called Square One. You know, they would we would open for them or they would open for us. Ray Mason, of course. Um, you know, there was a lot of, uh, the bamboo steamers. I mean, the list goes on and on. And it was re- the one thing that was really different at that point is there were a lot of clubs. There were a lot of places to play here locally and bands got paid. You know, I remember playing Theodore's one of my first gigs in the size way back when, and we played like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? September's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, <laughs> you could look at the Valley advocate and go in and see that there were, ba- where were the bands playing? And everyone had Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Friday, Saturday, or whatever the case may be. And they got paid, bands got paid, uh, to play. And then, uh, the loud music, music festival used to be here. And that was really great to, to, you know, everyone would just all of a sudden be in Northampton, you know, for a weekend playing around or, you know, all the different clubs. And that kind of, it kind of died off, you know, and, um, you know, there's reasons for that probably, you know, and, um, you don't want to go too deep into my thinking on why, but, right. you know, it's kind of sad now when you look to where it's, maybe you can play at this one club or you can play the parlor room or you can open up for somebody and play a, a 45 minute set and you're, you're not getting paid by the way. Yeah. Uh, you might get maybe half price beer or something, but it's, it kind of, it kind of stinks. So it kind of, you know, takes away from it. I mean, there's, there's little, um, Coffee shop, you know, like Luthier's Co-op, you know, you can play there. I don't know what they what they do for their bands, but, um, you know, back then it was really thriving. And it was really, uh, with the breakdown, you know, we used to we used to play with them. Uh, we used to play all over New England. You know, we were ready. It was, it was, right. it was we were working on our, working on our own tunes. I don't, I don't think you know? that, that is all that different from a lot of other cities around the country. Not necessarily like your larger cities where there may be other opportunities, but. Right. In smaller towns throughout America, you're you're really kind of seeing that too. Like you almost have to create your own opportunities. Yeah. And places that may not traditionally have music may have it. With the pandemic, that's kind of throwing a monkey wrench yeah. into the whole thing. Yeah, virtual. It, yeah. I I mean, know I know a lot of people that went down that road for a while, mm-hmm. and you know, with you know, varying levels of success, but people are finding new ways, right? Untraditional ways of of getting out there and and playing. Yeah. But but in the nineties, yeah. What happened to get you guys noticed by record companies? Because obviously mm-hmm. it, was, it was more than just one. And there was, yeah. what, what was uh, what was that led up to you guys getting signed? Well, I think, you know, just to your point there, I think that the little bit of the difference, um, you know, creating the opportunity in a smaller area like where we're from in Northampton versus maybe a Boston or New York City. If you get a gig in Boston or New York City you're, and you're a band, maybe it was like you had an opening slot. Maybe they had, right. you know— different bands and you would say hey we're playing you tell all your friends hey we're playing on this date this saturday night or this friday night at this club come on down and see us and that would be your big gig for us out here we would already had been playing every thursday friday saturday in various clubs either locally or around the region we played in maine a lot uh you know new hampshire we, we just played all over the place and we were always playing so we actually um we're fortunate enough to play a show for what was called the cmj i don't know if you remember that the college, college music, music journal. journal yeah i do 
And so we went to New York City. We got slotted at the China Club. And I forget what night we played, but we uh, we ended up having a set to play for potential gigs in the future at these colleges. People would come out and say, oh, the size from wherever, and they're all area colleges. We can go, you know, come out and see them. It was sort of a showcase for their college uh, spring flings or different concerts that they'd put on at their own schools. And uh, lo and behold, for to us, the guy who booked the China Club, a guy named Tommy Allen, uh, was a huge Power Pop fan. And when he saw us, he came over to us after and was just like, where have you guys been? You know, like, <laughs> what the heck? I got to work with you, you know, kind of thing. And, of course, you know, we're like, sure, sure, you know. And let's go back, you know, 30 years where it's like, you know, you can't just text me your number. It was just sort of right. like, you know, carrier pigeon or snail mail or whatever <laughs> you have to get in touch with these people. So I got his phone number at the China Club, and, uh, we, you know, it took about a year or so to kind of – make a relationship with him to the point where he brought his partner of his production company named John D. Nicola, who uh, co-wrote The Time of My Life and Hungry Eyes for Dirty Dancing. So Tommy and John kind of had connections, you know, and they, they were like, we got to do a demo with you guys. We want to produce you and, and shop it. Right. And we're like, so you're saying you're going to cover the expense of the demo and you're going to shop it? And yes, that's what we're going to do. And <laughs> Fam- you're gonna- Famous last words. Yeah, right, right, right. exactly. How much is it going to cost me? And then... um you know, then it's gonna. Then it, we we were just like, okay. And then Tommy said, well, I booked the China Club, so we can do showcases here whenever we want. So we any any night that we can draw some attention, we can have you guys open the night, and so it'll be earlier. And uh, we were like, okay. So th- it really kind of you know it took you know eight years of playing around New England and a lot of shows and developing our songs, uh, many songs, uh, to get the opportunity to finally do a real showcase. So we played a couple showcases, and the the last one I remember that we did that was sort of kind of a cool thing is we rented a Peter Pan bus uh, from locally, and we filled the bus with our friends and fans and people. And a buddy of ours, you know, took care of all the tickets and the money, and I don't know if he had beer on there and maybe a cooler and sandwiches or whatever, but it was a ticket price. Of course, getting into the club didn't cost anything, so it was right. just a, this – Peter Pan pulled up in front of China Club, and 50 or so of our friends and fans and family uh, got off the bus, Tony included. My brother Tony's always been a supporter, <laughs> big supporter of, of, of mine. We we um, we did a showcase for Phil Cordero from Charisma Records and a few others, and you know it happened very quickly when it happened. You know of that of all those years we played when it when it finally took off and we've got to the point where we were entertaining offers happened within months. It was. Really fast. So you hear that a lot. It's usually like a like a zero to sixty type of proposition. Yeah. The moment you know you you sign that contract, it's like whoosh. You know now we're going to talk about albums. And for you guys, mm. you know your first, you have this demo. You've got you know songs ready to go. At this point, eight years in, you're a well oiled machine. And they assign. I don't know if they assigned you an Ed Stasium or did you get a chance to select who was going to produce that first record. Yeah, we actually were very fortunate. Again, like I mentioned, you know, with Tommy Allen and John D. Nicola being very connected. Uh, they, Tommy, I believe, was very good friends with Ed because Ed did all the Ramones records and a bunch of records. And so, I don't know. So he Talking had, he had, head, smithereens, living color. He, yeah. he had a hell of a resume on him. Yeah, he just came, I think he just came off the, uh, I think he just did a record right before us. I, I want to say it might have. I want to say it was Smithereen's 11 record. Yeah. It was, we were pr- pretty much shortly thereafter. But um, we, we loved his production of that and, and Living Color and some of the others, Jeff Healy and mm-hmm. Marshall Crenshaw and all the, you know, obviously the Ramones, you know, you you can't deny that sound. So we, we thought, and Tommy was like, Ed's, Ed, Ed's the guy. You yeah. Know? And we didn't really entertain too many other, other uh, producers other than Tommy and John because they were co-producers on the record, and they, they have a very, very good ear for, for uh, producing music and arrangement and things like that. Um, Ed's right-hand man, a guy named Paul Hammingson, was his engineer, and Paul really is the one that kind of dialed in all the sounds for yeah. the most part, you know, But and Ed would f- refine the sounds. But um, Ed was, um, he really taught us how to make a record. You know, we, we, we would go in the studio, and it'd be a couple takes and be done with it, and this was a, a very different process. It was, you know, doing track after track, getting it to try to, at the end of really listening and making sure everything was the way he wanted it, uh, getting it to sound live. Because we were, we were we kind of pride ourselves on being a very good live band. That was kind of one of our things that we thought, like, if we can we can do three-part harmony and play and sing, you know, we'll just go in and rip it out, you know, and be done, you know. <laughs> and, you know, eight weeks later, yeah, we, you know, 
But uh, yeah. well, you know, well, the thing that I noticed about the, the the first record, and I assume that stays really, it's pretty endemic of 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 his of his sound back then. But in 1992, you're talking about a a, a pretty major transition oh, yeah. of commercially successful music. I mean, mm-hmm. they, there had been you know all these glam rock bands from the late 80s going into the early 90s. But if you listen to the production of that first record, yeah, it, it's got almost a timeless sound to it. it it's not like some bands where they were so overproduced and 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 were trying to ape onto a genre or a sound right it's a sound that really holds up and he is and he did that a lot yeah in his career i mean yeah. you, the, you talk like marshall crenshaw right those albums that he did the production on that you know holds up forever it's like a, yeah. it's like it, it never become it never sounds dated yeah i think i you know thinking back then too because there were a lot of bands uh i know you're speaking to the the you know grunge was about to happen yep you know nirvana's record we were in the studio making uh what goes on and we we picked up uh never never mind and we cranked it in the studio we were like wow just different <laughs> you know we hadn't really heard anything you know team right. spirit we just hadn't heard anything like that but we were thinking like you know when you had bands like jellyfish and Gin Blossoms, Spin Doctors. There was there was many many bands that were kind of in that mix of not the glam stuff and not the grunge stuff that went on to be successful. Uh, for the most part, Wallflowers were out at that point. You know, Lenny Kravitz was happening. There was there was a, there was a good mix of bands back then. Um, you know, even you know Brother Kane probably and some some other little bit maybe you know heavier a little bit of a southern rock kind of vibe. So. You know, we just did our thing. So I guess, you know, the interesting thing for us is, you know, when we would do, you know, we, we it was kind of just a, uh, you know, here's some guys from Northampton, Holyoke, Northampton area, and, and um, we're in A&M Studios in Studio A where they do, we, they shot We Are the World, you know, and that's where we were cutting drums, you know, months later. And we're just sitting, we have runners that will go get us whatever we want. We're just <laughs> laughing. Like, we became friends with all the guys that worked there because right. they knew all the cool spots to go at night. So, you know, here we are in the studio, and it was a new thing for us to, to track and record a certain way where we spent really, I hate to say it, but we, I think we probably spent a good, you know, seven, eight day, days on the drums, getting the drums right, you know, yeah. uh, after doing pre-production for a few weeks um, where there was a lot of splicing and a lot of, you know, editing to the drums and, you know, um, and then we did bass. Like, it, it just took longer, you know, and, and that's kind of what we were, you know, a little bit, it was new for us. Did we agree with it or didn't we agree with it? I guess at the end of the day, when he would hit play at the end of the day, we'd go, wow. Wow. <laughs> right. Because it was all of us playing, and yeah. Tommy's playing drums, and I was playing bass, and if they you know, punched in or edited something, it was still me playing it. Maybe it was a different take or whatever, but you know, a drum fill would be really cool in the third take, and he'd move it and splice it and drop it in on the first take of the drum track, the keeper t- you know, take. So all of that was kind of new to us. A lot of stuff, uh, double tracked, triple tracked, quadruple tracked, whatever. Right. Um, guitar parts, you know, layering, you know, stacking. Um, and Ed was really a stickler. I, I have to admit, there was I was doing some backing vocals um, for a song, and I was. I was getting a little bit upset because what I was hearing in my headphones sounded pretty good to me. Right. And he, he reminded me that he was the producer. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> it, it took a while. But when we were done and he hit play, and I when I came back in, I was just, I was very uh, happy with what he, yeah. he'd gotten out of me, I guess, you know. I hear that happens a lot you know, today with, with auto-tune. You don't have to spend three days doing vocals, but, you know, sure, it's, back in the day... You had to, and you and yeah. you had to get the most out of a guy yeah. that you that you could, because like you say, if you're performing live, you know you're only doing it once, right? And you either do it right, or you hope you do better the next, yeah, you know, the next part of the of, of yeah. the song or the next song or yeah. you know whatever it may be. Yeah, with live, it's kind of funny because you 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 if you record yourself, you think you knit, you're like, oh man, it was the best night of my life, and you go back and listen, and you're like, ooh. Because everything's coming off the board. It's there's no you right. know ne- it's not necessarily what comes through the speakers. It's every all the microphones are running through the the uh, the board. So you're kind of really get a real like microscopic kind of like oh man that's that was ooh I thought I saw <laughs> that sounded a little better there. So we try not to do that. Right. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned uh, Jellyfish. That's that's a band that I've been a fan of since the very beginning. Yeah. They were a band that had extraordinary talent and 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 real songwriting gifts, but they were. The timing of that band was horrendous, mm. and you know they were coming out just as grunge was changing music, yeah. and charisma 
rightly or wrongly, I don't think really knew what to do with a band like this. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, they had two brilliant records that yeah. went nowhere. Mm -hmm. In a case like the uh, the size, you know, obviously you guys finish the record, you go out on the road, you're promoting the hell out of it, you're going to radio stations, you're doing all the things that you are supposed to do. Do you feel like you got what you needed from promotion and and push from them, or or do you think they they at that point? Because I mean, charisma had been. I mean, they had a long-standing history of yeah. of success. Yeah. At that point in their history, do you think you got what you needed out of them? Yeah, I think you know it. We we listened to the first Jelly Belly Button record. We li we loved that record. Yeah. Phenomenal production was great, and we knew that the the label was going to invest money because that's something you look for. Like, okay, if they're, they're going to take something serious enough, are they going to put the resources behind it? Promotion. You name it too, and when we heard Jellyfish Belly Button, we said, "Yeah, th this is a good label for us." And um, you know, we we not that we were in alignment with them necessarily, but uh, John, the Jellyfish success side of it, you know, I don't know that they would have had real commercial success. I think, it th you know, looking over the last thirty years now, people who know of Jellyfish love that record. No, find it and buy it. You yeah. Know? So they had they had a different level of type of success, sort of like maybe they. Uh, you know, Big Star or 10CC or these other bands that are kind of like, huh, what are, and, but people find them. Yeah. You know, so, some friend that plays a, for somebody else who plays it for somebody else and they find them and they become fans too. For us, you know, we we ha we made a really great record. Label was behind it. We could tell they were putting money into us in the label, which means they were going to promote it afterwards. And we went out on the road, played with a lot of the bands I mentioned earlier, you know, Spin Doctors, Jim Blossoms. Mm -hmm. uh, we were on the road with Dada quite a bit too. And, um, you know, it just started, we started hearing rumblings that the, the label was being, uh, not sold, but it was merging with its parent company, Virgin Records. Right. And that's really where the problem, it was, I, you know, I don't know that it was grunge that changed it or any of that. I think if we had been on Charisma the whole time, I think we would have found our lane and had yeah. a different type of success. Well, I, I, and, yeah. but that happens more often than not where, where a band in the middle of a, of like a court, not a court, well, I mean, a corporate takeover or a trans, a, a business transition. Sure. The the existing bands on that label sometimes get lost in the shuffle. That's right. And you know, the size would not be the only band, right? That happened to you. Talked about uh, you know Big Star. You know, there's a band that also had that problem. They were with Stax, and you know what? You know, at the time, you know, prior to to that, you know, like Stax would have been a great label to be on, but sure. they got absorbed by. I'm trying to remember who it was. Whether it was Warner Brothers or you know, their parent company, right? their second album comes out, and, you know, with yeah. the same distribution problems the first time yeah. around. And you're almost like, Stax? Who signs with Stax? Yeah, I, right. I remember we were talking a few weeks ago about that. Yeah, yeah. but that's, but yeah, but it, it, it would have made sense, but, you know, uh, they got they got lost in, yeah. the, uh, in, the, in the business. Yeah, it's just like any merger or anything, uh, you know, we've been in this business a long time, and you see a company buy another company, you got two GMs, two sales managers, two sales staffs, yep. two whatevers, and you got to make one. You know, had we been on Virgin, maybe we would have been okay. You know, our Phil Corderero became the president of Virgin Records, and we were brought over onto the roster of Virgin Records. And and it kind of, um, you know, from there, it's a little cloudy. I think we all in the band, even John DiNicola, we all have our own version of what happened. You know, kind of close, but there's some little things I didn't know, and I just found out, you know, oh, really, that happened or this happened? <laughs> and, it, you know, we just, yeah, we, we were, uh, we had the, Best hope that we were going to record a new record. We were told to record a new record, and we were sending demos in to our A and R guy, uh, Danny Goodwin, and he was giving us a lot of pushback. And it was very frustrating for us at the time because we had been sort of like the last six months had been like, "What the hell's going on?" We were just killing it out there on the road with Dada, right, all over the country, and now we get pulled off the road to make a new record. And, and you know, I'm fast forwarding through the story, but basically, you're telling us no, and you know, and he was. An interesting guy, and, you know, if you can imagine, say we, we pitched 40 songs or something like that, and he basically said he heard uh, half of one song was good, is what he told us. So <laughs> out, we, of, out of 40. Out of 40. So it was a big F you. You know, yeah. we had done a lot of um, co-writing with John DiNicola, who mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, Time of My Life, Hungry Eyes. He's written for John Waite, uh, Eddie Money. The list goes on. Steve Holy, a lot of a lot of great bands. He's, he's a hit songwriter. And, you know, we would 
share ideas with him and we'd go back and forth. We we felt that we didn't think we had 40 hits, but we thought we'd have more than a half of one song at that point. <laughs> so, you know, we started, uh, we, we, we put out a, a second record on or on on Big Deal Records called Different, and it was a little bit of a thumbs up to, or not thumbs up, a middle finger, I should say, fly, fly the number one. <laughs> Uh, you know, you're, you're number one with me kind of right. with, uh, two, two Danny Goodwin at charisma records, you know, was, there was, and that kind of hurt us, I think a little bit as far as the critics, because we were angry, you know, obviously. And, um, we, we got away from writing about the things that we enjoyed writing about, um, you know, and started writing about why we were so angry at the record label or just one individual. <laughs> so, but you know, the, the, it, it's like you said earlier, it happens to a lot of bands, you know, it was unfortunate. We didn't necessarily see it coming. Yeah. And, uh, and luckily for us, we've been able to, uh, remain closest of friends over the years and, and do new records and do new music over the last couple of years. Right. And, uh, we got a big show coming up this year in June on, uh, June 12th. That's your 30th so anniversary. June 11th or June 12th. That's yeah. your 30th anniversary. Yeah. Gateway city arts yeah. in Holyoke. We're going to be doing a uh, 30th anniversary of what goes on. So we're going to, play that record down and some surprises hopefully That's a, that, yeah. that venue is actually kind of su- a surprising venue they they have put great shows yeah obviously yeah. with covid you know things yeah. have uh, have changed but you know they're starting to bring back some pretty notable people and uh, you know, and and not just the size but you yeah. know, I'm, I'm you know over the years I'm kind of like how the hell did they get that you know that band or well, those guys I mean yeah, they did a good job well it's DSP you know John Sanders uh, who worked for um, in Northampton quite a bit, booking the Calvin and booking, um, you know, Iron Horse and, and Pearl Street and all the venues up there. Um, you know, he's the one that owns DSP now, mm-hmm. and he, he's the one with the connections. He's the one that's – he's the one that putting putting those bands in there. He's He's got those uh, – he's got the corner on that market. So he called and he said, hey, uh, I'd love to do a show with you guys. And we were actually thinking about doing it like New Year's Eve this, you know, into 21 to 22. And right. kind of glad we – we're like, well, got a couple guys flying in, so what about weather? And, you know, we were just kind of hedging, and we're like, hey, you know what? Actually, six months later was our 30th anniversary. Probably safe to say we won't have snow in June. And uh, <laughs> Never say never. It's yeah, still I New know, England. I know. I should uh, knock on wood. <laughs> right? um, and it, it just worked out for everybody also with their schedules a little bit, you know, not with the holidays and, and everything else. And, yeah. and you know, uh, Bobby – uh, Robert LaRoche lives in Austin, Texas, and he tours quite a bit with uh, Patricia Vaughn in Europe. So, mm-hmm. um, getting making sure that didn't conflict with him and his schedule. So, uh, so June it is. Yeah, and and you are doing new music. With, we're gonna with yeah, the band. Yeah, we're gonna do. Um, so right before the pandemic happened, um, we were we put out a, an EP called um, "Tearing My Heart Again," and um, we and we noticed that. You know, we, we didn't get a chance to really play. We were supposed to play Marshall Mania in Holyoke, which is a parade committee event. Right. And it was at the warehouse. It was upstairs. And, we, and that was going to be our sort of our CD release that didn't happen. So we'll play a lot of songs off of Tearing My Heart again. Uh, we'll bring some stuff back from uh, Wait on Another Day, which is the full-length uh, CD that we did a few years ago, which were some of the songs that didn't make it to What Goes On and a couple new ones. So... Um, There'll be a variety of tunes in there, yeah. Nah. It is June 11th, by the way. I just checked on my phone, so <laughs> that's right. But, uh, but so, I mean, yeah. you guys are still, in, in spite of all the years you've been together, you're still yeah. pretty tight. You're still, you know, looking to gr- make, you know, music together. I think that's yeah. I think that's kind of cool. I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, situations occur where it just, you know, puts a, a, a divide between yeah. the members of the band. That hasn't been the case with you guys. No, we've, we're, we're, we're best of friends. As a matter of fact, uh, Bax, a lot, a lot of times on the road, you know, it'd be us out on the road. We wouldn't know anybody. We didn't have text. We didn't have phone. You know, we, we were just out there doing our thing, and we play a lot of cards. That was yeah. our big thing. We play a lot of poker over the years. Even before we were signed, we used to have some m- massive games, really, really, you know, dealer's choice kind of nonsense games. Um, a lot of laughs, a lot of fun. So we, we, even the years that we didn't play, I think we went almost 12 years without playing a show together. We probably got together and played cards when we were all together. <laughs> so, and then one time we were just like, hey, what, don't, what, what if we did a reunion show? And we, we ended up doing that at, at Pearl Street um, several years ago, I think 2008 or nine or something. So um, the way it kind of works is like I have a, my own, and it's kind of always worked this way, I guess. Um, I write songs, um, some fit the size some are on the on the line, right? You know, maybe someone from my EP breathe could be size songs. Like she's, 
good could be a, a size tune uh, just it wasn't uh, i don't think we were even considering something like that when i wrote that tune uh, way back when um that, i think that song i wrote in 1997 or 98 oh really and it just kind of i played it for bobby i said hey i found this song on a an old uh cd or something he's like you got to put that on the ep tommy you know so anyway <laughs> But, but you know, a lot of that's – and then he writes his own – obviously, he's got a very successful solo career, Robert right. LaRoche. You know, he does his his music. And, and so we kind of find the ones that work, you know, as size songs. Um, yeah. And I'll pitch him a bunch of tunes. He might be like, mm, not sure about that one. This one's good, though. This one we can we can work up a little bit more. So we always have the opportunity to do that. And that's kind of what, how we, uh, we make music. And especially – Nowadays, with the computers the way they are in, in digital recording. And file sharing, too. File sharing. Yeah. You know, we were talking about that a few weeks ago. I just yeah. upgraded my system at home, and I just, uh, uh, last night, a friend of mine did some backing vocals. I sent him a, uh, a stereo track of a new song, and he said, hey, I'm hearing a couple parts here and there, and you might mind if I just lay them down and send them back to you? I said, yeah, go ahead, do whatever. So he did, and I was like, that sounds really cool. Can you send me the track, the, the vocal parts? And so he just dropped box. I download them, put them in my song, and I just move them around, and drop them in, and yeah, he's like simple, isn't it? And he lives, you know, <laughs> not close. Yeah. So same with Bobby. You know, when we were doing uh, "She's Good" on uh, the Breathe EP, um, he was in Austin, and he was tracking, and I said, "Hey, can you sing the low part on the chorus?" And he said, "Yeah." So then he did the same thing, and of course, I recorded. Uh, four of the six songs I recorded in New York with John DiNicola. Yeah. Uh, we did it at his studio in upstate New York. So. Um, Bobby and or John and, and Bobby's producer were going back and forth the file sharing and next thing I was like Bobby's in the room with me singing harmonies so Be, before I let you go yeah. I, I do want to ask you about uh, about the beer mm. it'll be, I would be it would be wrong to have you in here without uh, without, sell, without selling any? some beer no, I don't have any beer. I think I had a, a bottle of yeah. vodka in, the, yeah. in my office every guest gets a bottle of vodka and maybe some <laughs> beer but not today <laughs> well I, I'll crack that a bottle of vodka when we when we celebrate something uh, real big but uh, but tell me about the about the beer. Yeah, so uh, several years ago, obviously in in the years of playing music and everything else, um, I got into golf, and uh, and it was a really great way to spend some time when you're on the road. We'd go to, uh, like you mentioned earlier, a lot of radio stations to do a promotional, uh, you know, stu- uh, either in um, in studio performance or an interview or whatever. And we'd always ask, like, hey, is there a golf course nearby we should check out? And inevitably, they would say, hey, we'll take care of it. We have trade over there at the <laughs> golf course. So. We were playing some pretty cool golf courses, and it was a great way to spend some time, you know, just decompressing and being on the road and having a lot of fun. So, you know, with the craze of craft beer and everything, I I had this notion or this idea, and I had a friend of mine who was the brewer at Northampton Brewery at the time, and I was like, you know, there should be a beer called Swing Oil for golfers, you know, (laughs) because Swing Oil is your favorite beverage on the golf course no matter what to help improve your game, right? Right. The mental part of your game or whatever. For some of us, it's the only part of our game. Exactly, right. So... Uh, we, we, my, I was talking to a buddy of my, mine, Mike Peralt, and we, uh, we decided to get into this venture, a swing oil beer company. And we produce locally, you know, craft beer for mainly golf courses, but sports bars and package stores. And we're, we're actually, um, it, it's, it's getting, uh, it's getting out there. We're That's in awesome. Connecticut, Massachusetts. We're opening to land a few uh, new States this, this year. Uh, we got a lot of work to do over the next couple months to get it ready, uh, to get out there. But yeah, and it's, it's, uh, just some nice, flavorful craft beer to help you improve your game. We always say, play like your name's on the bag. So <laughs> drink like your name's on the bag or something like that. But, That's awesome. Yeah. Well, listen, I, 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 I really mean this. I think the EP is, is fantastic. Thank you. And I'm really, I'm really proud of you because this is – I appreciate no, that. Thank it's, you. Not, it's not easy to make music, and it's yeah. not easy to make good music. And yeah. this, this really is very good. The name of the EP is Breathe on uh, OMAD Records. Tommy, it's good to see you. Thank you, Bax. I really appreciate having me on. Absolutely. Thank Thank you. Care. Again, the name of the new EP from Tommy Pluta is called Breathe. It is really, really good. I hope you get it. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Today's podcast is brought to you by Canna Provisions in Holyoke and Lee, Massachusetts. Check them out at cannaprovisions.com. If you like the show, feel free to share it, like it, review it, tell all your friends about it. You can reach me at Bax at rock102.com. I'd love to hear what you think. And thanks again for listening to Baxi's musical podcast.